So thanks everybody. Uh, you're all very welcome tonight. I'm Norma Sin. I'm chair of the Mary Ann McCracken Foundation and I'm delighted to welcome you whether you're with us here in Clifton House boardroom or attending via Zoom. This is the inaugural annual Mary Ann McCracken lecture. And I'd like to pay a special welcome to Councillor Michael Long, the High Sheriff of Belfast, who's joined us here this evening in Clifton House. So what is the Mary Ann McCracken Foundation? Well, Belfast Charitable Society established the foundation a couple of years ago to celebrate Mary Ann's life and her achievements and to build on her legacy. She was born in 70, 1770 and lived until 1866, not a mean feat in those days. She was born into the merchant class and lived a life, a very long life, dedicated to the disadvantaged at home and abroad. She was a lifelong abolitionist she refused to eat produce associated with enslaved labour, such as sugar. And into her 90th year, she could be found at Belfast stops, handing out anti-slavery leaflets to emigrants on their way to the United States. She was also involved with the Poor House, opened by Belfast Charitable Society in 1774, and founded its Ladies' Committee in 1827. And she was a very formidable member of the Ladies' Committee. <coughs> She was a pioneer of both education and workers' rights, and it's her life and legacy that the Foundation want to promote, raising awareness not only of her life story, but also of her relevance today. We're looking at the causes that she fought for and that are still relevant in today's society and highlight social injustices just as she would have done. And why have we chosen tonight's topic? But we wanted to use this important occasion to raise awareness of the experiences and the challenges faced by those who are living in or fleeing from areas of conflict. And tonight we're going to explore what life is like for women in Afghanistan through first-hand accounts of those who have lived, worked there and subsequently left the country. These accounts are harrowing. They're open and they're very honest and they reflect each person's lived experience. We're very grateful to each of our speakers, grateful that they've agreed to share their personal stories and equally important is the contribution from closer to home. And we'll also be hearing from a representative of the Law Centre. Tonight's event is chaired by Sir Ronnie Weather, President of Belfast Charitable Society. And Sir Ronnie will also facilitate the question and answer session after our speakers finished. Just in a matter of uh, technicality, if you want to ask a question, please use the chat function on your Zoom and write any questions on that. And we also recommend that you use speaker view in Zoom for the best viewing experience. And I'd also like to say that the event is being recorded. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to our president, Sir Ronnie. Thank you very much, uh, Norma, and a good evening, everyone. Uh, all our viewers, as well as those who are uh, present here in Clifton House uh, uh, today. Uh, this uh, magnificent uh, room is the room that was built in 1774 when Clifton House uh, opened and it, it has hosted many great events and uh, this, I think, is uh, one of them. Uh, a special welcome then to everyone. And we're going to deal with a most important uh, topic uh, uh, this evening, uh, something which is not at the forefront of public consciousness to the extent that I believe it should be. And hopefully this event uh, this evening uh, will seek to address that shortcoming. Uh, I want to uh, commend the Mary Ann McCracken uh, Foundation and uh, Norma, who leads that uh, organization and that foundation. Uh, for uh, putting this together to highlight the uh, predicament and the plight of uh, women in uh, uh, Afghanistan. Now, this issue uh, is a real living present uh, instance of wholesale suppression of women's rights in uh, a part of the uh, world and is not receiving at the moment the coverage and attention uh, that it should. I hope a remedy of some sort will be provided this evening. I want to extend my sincere uh, thanks to our speakers uh, this evening who, who are from Afghanistan, 
or originated in Afghanistan and for reasons you will hear are unfortunately no longer resident in their uh, homeland. Um, also uh, this evening, and we're going to hear from Liz Griffiths, who's sitting opposite me here from the Law Centre in uh, uh, Northern Ireland. Now, each uh, contributor has been invited uh, to speak for a short period. So in that, to that extent, uh, uh, this is a fragmented lecture, uh, but it will be in four uh, parts. Uh, and each contributor, when, they have, when you have heard their story, will move to a question and answer session and uh, you can ask your questions through the chat line as Norma has uh, uh, su suggested. With that, I'm going to turn to our first uh, speaker, who's uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Simi Nazari. We have in fact three exceptionally uh, brave and gifted uh, speakers uh, this evening from uh, Afghanistan. Uh, Dr. Simi Nazari is one of them. Uh, she is not able to speak English, and the translations will be by Bilal Naziri. Uh, and uh, if you would bear with us, she will give part of her talk. Uh, uh, Bilal will translate uh, for us, and then she will provide uh, uh, another paragraph, and so on. Uh, and that's the way we uh, propose to do it. But just a word about their uh, backgrounds. Uh, uh, Dr. Nazari was born in uh, Kabul. She was raised by her uncle in Iran so that she could secure uh, an early education. She's a member of the Hazara ethnic group. Um, Hazariat is a, a region in central Afghanistan and the uh, Hazari population there is some four million uh, people. It's the third largest ethnic group in uh, Afghanistan. Uh, she studied at Tehran University and later at university in uh, Kabul. She qualified as a doctor. She specialized in obstetrics and uh, uh, gynecology. Uh, unfortunately, her parents and her siblings left Afghanistan some years ago and uh, settled in Europe. Uh, but she stayed behind uh, to provide a service for women uh, as a doctor in uh, her uh, home country. She faced danger in doing so and following the Taliban takeover in August of uh, this year, uh, she uh, felt compelled uh, to leave Afghanistan and uh, she escaped and is now uh, a refugee in Ireland. Uh, Bilal Naziri, uh, 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 who is going to translate uh, for Sima, uh, was uh, also raised in uh, Kabul, and he is remarkably fluent in uh, six uh, languages. Uh, he was a cultural advisor and interpreter for the British forces in Afghanistan from 2009, 2009 to 2014, and he led a team of 40 interpreters <coughs> in uh, Afghanistan. Uh, but following death threats, uh, he too had to leave, and he moved to Australia at the end of 2014 when the British forces left uh, Afghanistan, where he remains. Uh, he has an intimate knowledge of the country uh, and of the securing of safe passage for those who wish to leave the uh, country, and he has contributed greatly uh, to that unfortunate exodus. He and his wife and children are living in Australia, and I'm pleased to say he's a student of law and of uh, uh, criminology. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand over uh, to uh, Dr. Simon Nazari and Bilal Naziri, and if you'll forgive us, Bilal will first of all uh, translate uh, to Siva uh, and uh, what has been happening and what is going to happen. And she will speak, he will translate, and in that way we'll complete this uh, exercise. So Bilal, could I ask you to ask Siva uh, to make her contribution? Sure. 
سیما جان میتونه شما مو چی تا نو بخونیم پیش تا نو باز سه سه پاراگراف بخونیم ما ترجمه میکنم شروع کنیم شان سیما جان شروع کنیم شما میتونین حال شروع کنیم چی تا پاراگراف تا نو بخونیم سلام میکنم با تک تک شان و احترام میکنم خوش هستم که مرا لایق دانستان و در برنامه خوبشان دعوت کردن سپاس و درود فراوان برشن Hello everyone, thanks for having me um, Thanks for the invitation I'm glad to be here in this good event دیگه شروع میکنم دکتر سیما نظری هستم ما دکتر جی پی هستم متولد کابل افغانستان می باشم دوره کودکی خود در کابل گذرانده Uh, hello, my name is Dr. Sima Nazari. I'm a GP. Um, I was born in Kabul, Afghanistan. I spent my childhood in Kabul, Afghanistan. Ma maktaba dar Iran khalas kadim. Az donishgah ulum pizishki Tehran faruk tasil shede. Dar nakte tasili lisans va mastari. Dar rishte midwifery ya mamayi faruk tasil shede. I studied in Iran. I graduated from Tehran University of Medical Science in 2006 with a bachelor and master's degree in midwifery. Ma dar sal 2007 ba inwan ustad dar donishgah ulum tibbi Kabul qabul shudam. Dar hamin zaman Afghanistan amadam. I came to Afghanistan in 2007. I was accepted as a, a teacher in Kabul. Uh, in uh, Tehran University of Medical Science, and that's when I came to Afghanistan. Dar sal 2015, ma dar rishte curative medicine ya tib malajavi ba inwan doctor GP ya medical doctor az donishgah TB chira far tasil shudem. I graduated in 2015 from Chira Medical University in Kabul, Afghanistan. in the field of creative uh, medicine as a doctor, GP. Yeah. I was the goal that I came to Afghanistan because women in Afghanistan had a lot of power in Afghanistan. I was the goal that I came to Afghanistan and I wanted to be able to help them and to be able to help them and to be able to help them. و حمایت بکنم از حق و حقوقشان و به اونا بپیوندم این هدف ما بود یک her purpose to return to afghanistan uh, was because afghan women are more at risk uh, physically and mentally um, um, and mainly from um, medical uh, perspective and um, she, her, uh, her reason to come back was to serve afghan women uh, through her uh, medical degree uh, to help the afghan women ما در شفاخانه های مختلف افغانستان به صورت تخصصی در قسمت زنان، زایمان و ماینات تلویزیونی به صورت یا هم ماینات اولتراسان به صورت تخصصی کار کردیم. I work in various uh, medical hospitals as a midwife, as a, um, I work in ultrasound sector. Obstetric um, and gynecology. And what, what she just said. درست دیگه انگیزه ی ازی که ما دکتر شدم ای بوده که یکی علاقه شخصی خودم بود دیگه حمایت از طرف خانواده ام بوده تشویقایشان بود که مخصوصا پدر و مادرم نقش داشتم میخویم بود نه بخون بگین ما بازم بگو دیگه اما تبیز جنسیتی بود انگیزی دکتر شدن بود یک دقیقه که این باشه شما اینجا مانده It was her desire to come and serve in Afghanistan and her family support to empower women and to help women through her medical degree بیخی مره چیز دیگه نه 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 انگیزی دکتر شدن بود علاقی شخصی که بوده یک دقیقه در کجا هست؟ در قسمت سیبون بودک انگیزی دکتر شدن ما از سیرا رو واس کردیم از خاطر نه سیرا رو واس نکشتباس ده او از سیرا کلش اشتباه بوده 
در کجا ما برتن رایی کلم هم بخاطر شما در واتساپ است سری گیو از وان سیکند اول بیوگرافیست باز عدف آمدن است باز انگیز است امونایی که جدول هستن که به ما روان کردی در انتهای زمون آه خیلی موریویشن فکر کنم در اونا خیلی اشتباه چیشنه سهی شد اینا را سر بگی نمی بخشی چی تانه انگیزه که من دکتر شدم یک علاقه شخصی خودم بود تشویق و امایت های خانواده بود مخصوصا پدر و مادرم دیگه تبیز جنسیتی در افغانستان بود نسبت به دختران بود که من ثابت کردم که یک زن یا یک دخترم میتونه در جامعه خود نقش مثبت داشته باشه در افغانستان یعنی یک اصل برابری بین زن و مرد her motivation uh, to become a doctor it was her personal interest and uh, it was the courage of uh, and support of her family especially her parents and um, and the gender discrimination against girls uh, she wanted to prove that a woman can also play a major role in Afghanistan society ga مشکلات که ما در زمان تحصیل داشتم یکی در ایران بود که وارد شدن و قبول شدن به عنوان یک افغان بسیار بسیار مشکل بود و دومی که در افغانستان بود در افغانستان چون ما دانشگاهی که میخواندم پرایویت یا شخصی بود وقتی که ما امی کیوراتیف میدیسینه میخواندم یا طب مال جویره که به عنوان دکتر جی پی شدم با مخاطر هزینه دانشگاه و مصارف دانشگاه به ما بسیار سنگین بود ما مجبور بودم که هم کار بکنم و هم درس بخونم یعنی در شفاخانه کار میکنم و هم درس میخوندم و اوکی پرابلمز وت استادینگ ان ایران فرست اف اول ایت واز ویری دیفیکلت تو انتر اند بی اکسپتد از ان افغان ان ایران اند وین شی ستارت استادینگ ان کابل افغانستان It was difficult because she was studying in a private university and um, because of the difficulty to pay for her university, she had to do both work and study at the same time and being away from her family outside Afghanistan and being alone as a woman in traditional society was not... دیگه مشکلات صحی زنان افغانستان بر اساس امی آمار WHO که است مادران افغانستان بالاترین میزان مرگ میره دارن یعنی به اعضای هر یک یازده نفر یک نفر می میرن که بسیار یک آمار بالا می باشن افغان ومنس هل پرابلم اکارن تی WHO ستیستک افغان مادرس هفت ده هایس موتالیتی ریت at one in eleven women Uh, which is pretty high, uh, is the major cause of death. دلایل عمده مرگشان چی هستند؟ یکی عدم دسترسی به دکتر می باشه و دوا هست. دیگه عدم پذیرش دکتران در مناطق محروم به خاطر مشکلات امنیتی یعنی دکترها اجازه نمیشن. دیگه کیفیت خدمات صحی پایین است به خاطر که امکانات کم می باشن. Okay. Um, and the major cause of death is lack of access to doctors and medicine and, and not being admitted doctors uh, uh, doctors not being admitted due to security problems in deprived areas, poor quality of health services due to uh, insufficient facilities and poverty and cultural barriers. Oh, oh, کلش میگه دیگه خاطرات در محیط کار در شفاخانه هست یکی خاطرات خوب دارم یکی خاطرات بد دارم ما میخوایم اول خاطرات خوب بگویم تو تکت کم میگم لطفا ترجمهش کنه وقتی که با حداقل امکانات امیر بگویم باز رو میموری نگفته منو سنوز نگفته امی بخش خاطرات خوب بتن بگم memories in the hospital were replaced oh me me from good memories and bad memories she first want to speak about her good memories of her, her work time in afghanistan بفهم خاطر خوبی است که ما در افغانستان وقتی که با حداقل امکانات مسئولیت خود به خوبی انجام میدادم به عنوان یک دکتر این مرا بسیار خوش می ساخت احساس خوب داشتم باش امیر بگیم باز خاطره دیگه 
uh, good memories when when she was doing her job uh, very well um, as a doctor with the least facilities. Uh, that was her, that was that was giving her uh, pleasure. Uh huh. دیگه خاطرات تلخی نیست که وقتی که در جریان انفجار و انتحار کی بود اجساد و افراد زخمی را بر تدایی در شفخانه می آوردن وقتی که من با او حادثات رو برو می شدم این تلخترین و قمنگیسترین خاطره ای بود که هیچ وقت فراموش شدنی نیست بر من and the bodies and wounded people were brought to the hospital for treatment uh, that was very traumatized for her digama dalair umde ke afghanistan tarq kad mi bude ke yak mushkilat amniyati bud dalil umde ya asli bude va yani ke tamam dastavard hai ra ke ma da tul saliyan sal ba tamam mushkilat va mawane ke va chalish hai ke sar rahim bud در مرز خطر تهدید طالبا قرار گرفته بود یعنی اینا را به بسیار مشکل مبادست داورده بودم به مخاطر به مشکل برخوردم و مجبور شدم که به کمک دولت آیلند ما افغانستان را ترک بکنم و در اینجا به عنوان پناهنده قبول شم مجر ریزن فر لیوینگ افغانستان تو کم تو آیلند مای مین ریزن واس سیکیوری پرابلم آل اچیومنتس آی هاف اچیوید اوور دی ایرز وت آل دی ابستیکلز اند چالنجز آی فیس was threatened by Taliban and I was forced to leave the country uh, with the help of the Irish government and accepted here as a refugee. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Sima. Uh, that was a most compelling account, uh, and uh, I'm sure everyone uh, present here and who's listening is uh, moved by uh, your predicament, by your courage, uh, by the commitment you showed to the women in Afghanistan. And given the high risk that you accounted, uh, rec recounted, it is just extraordinary uh, that uh, the authorities should move to remove female medics from the support they can give uh, to address that risk. It's uh, barely believable. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Sima Jan. All of the friends who are in the house and the house, and the house, 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 قابل میگه تعجب است که یک دولت خانمایی که مثلا بسیار کمک میکنن دکترای مثل خود شما به خانمای دیگه وارا پاس کنن به جا کنن وظیفهشان بسیار میگه بسیار کار غلط است تشکر Now Bilal it's your turn to star on your own uh, are you ready for this? <laughs> yeah, um, I think that's a lot easier. Can, can you tell us something about your contacts with Sima, uh, your um, uh, present way in Australia, and uh, the work you're doing for the Afghan community back at home and in Australia? Hello, everyone. Um, uh, my name is Bilal Nasiri. Uh, I first met Seema uh, when it became clear she needed to flee Afghanistan in August uh, through some uh, amazing individuals. Um, my friend Tim sitting in the room, Sarah and Neve, uh, who works as part of uh, uh, Stephen Farris' team. Um, Stephen have arranged Irish visa for my family and did the same for Seema. Uh, I work with Neve and, and Sarah and Tim uh, to get Seema out of Kabul and across uh, the border to Pakistan. Um, there's, this would have been uh, a dangerous journey, dangerous journey for uh, anyone, but uh, for a single Hazara woman, uh, it took in incredible courage. Um, Seema played a crucial role in Afghanistan. Uh, she was a doctor um, and a midwife in the country where, um, as she said, uh, childbirth is a huge killer of women. Uh, Sima had no choice but to leave Afghanistan. Uh, like Sima, a huge number of professional women, active women, have been forced to flee Afghanistan. 
or have been um, banished from public life. Um, the loss of these women is enormous. Um, I think we can all appreciate how much Dr. Seema Nazari has lost uh, in the last few short months. What perhaps isn't obvious is what Afghanistan has lost uh, with the experiences of women from public and civil life, Dr. Seema Nazari. Uh, patients do not have a doctor woman. Many, many thousands of women will give birth without any medical help. Uh, this replicates across all areas of society. Um, I myself, I was raised by a single woman, my mother, who is my hero. Uh, let me share uh, with you guys a, a small story uh, of my mother. Uh, my mother is a widow who stand her ground not to get married, but rather to raise her sick children on her own in Afghanistan with no government support. Um, she was lucky. She was able to uh, go to a, a swimming course and learn a skill and very, very little and provide for us. Uh, and if it wasn't for her to be able to learn a skill, we wouldn't have been able to learn anything and be uh, any, uh, uneducated. Um, and um, like the education we have and my whole family right now, uh, if it wasn't for her. Even though it was hard to raise six children um, on her own, but she was lucky to be able to work from home and earn money. Uh, but the problem now in Afghanistan is that opportunity is taking from women. Um, and um, they're taken from women like my mother because they won't be able to go and do a course to learn a skill and provide for their families. There are so many women in Afghanistan today who are widows raising their children by their own under the Taliban. They will not be able to empower or even provide for their children um, in the way my mother did. And the reason my family left Afghanistan was because I used to work uh, with British troops in Afghanistan. Um, as a cultural advisor and linguist to fight for peace and stability. And because of that, my family had, uh, had uh, been threatened. Uh, they were threatened um, and their lives were in danger. Um, in terms of Afghanistan today, uh, winter is coming in Afghanistan. Um, and with winter, a uh, humanitarian crisis is coming. Um, I'm sure the news has reached you all uh, of, of Afghan families selling their babies, um, these parents do not sell their children because they love them less than Irish parents love their children. Um, it is an act of absolute desperation. They uh, sell their children because it is the only way of ensuring they survive the horrendous winter that they know is coming. <coughs> women and children will die of starving this winter. More women will die in childbirth this year than last year. The situation is even worse for widows like my mother they will have no means to provide for their children. The lights have been turned off in Afghanistan by the Taliban, but I'm asking everyone here not to forget the Afghan who have been left behind. Uh, they, I ask everyone here in audience and the charity organization, people with influence to help Afghanistan directly through uh, Afghan people who are willing to help those in need or through Afghan charity organization. So the poor and vulnerable people who are left behind get some help at this crucial time directly. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, uh, uh, Bilal, and uh, thank you uh, for uh, taking the time to uh, join us this evening and tell us your uh, story. I'm sure we're all humbled by uh, the, the trials for a basic life that you and others in your position ha have undergone, uh, and which is beyond uh, the experience of uh, most of us. Uh, so our heart goes out uh, to you and your family and uh, other families in the same uh, predicament. Now, I, I want to introduce our third uh, speaker, and uh, that is uh, Sarah, Kalikyar, and I hope I pronounced it, her, her name uh, properly because she's been practicing it with me uh, earlier uh, the, this evening. So she'll tell me off if I didn't uh, succeed. Uh, Sarah, uh, too, uh, grew up in uh, Kabul and her father was a driver for the uh, Ministry of uh, Defense. Uh, her family were targeted by the Taliban due to his work and uh, as well as the family's Tajik 
ethnic background and some, sadly some of their family members were killed by Taliban forces. Now the Tajik uh, uh, ethnic group uh, is uh, based in Afghanistan and in neighboring Uzbekistan and Kajikistan, which are uh, two territories to the northern border of Afghanistan. There are about 10 million uh, ethnic Tajiks in uh, Afghanistan. It's the second largest uh, ethnic group in the um, uh, country. Sarah fled from Afghanistan when she was aged uh, six years old, and uh, she's now a voice for many Afghans uh, who are facing uh, oppression. <coughs> she's recently graduated uh, uh, in the UK in politics and international relations, for which she is due uh, to be uh, congratulated, and she's about to begin uh, a professional career. At present, she's assisting other uh, family, friends and the family within Afghanistan who need support and within her local community uh, in uh, England where she's uh, currently uh, based. So uh, Sarah, can you tell us something more of your story? Thank you so much for having me here today and hi everyone. Um, I am Sara Kalikia, he pronounced it correctly. Um, as he mentioned, um, my father fled Afghanistan in the early 1990s as a result of the war. Um, he faced many trials and hardships through his journey to get to the UK. And the process of getting myself and my mother took extremely long. And um, when I was at the age of six, I was able to leave Afghanistan and come to the UK. Um, it was very difficult to adjust to at first. Um, I didn't know the language or anything. And when I started school, I didn't even know how to, you know, ask for basic things or even just simply ask to go to the bathroom. Um, nevertheless, I was able to slowly adjust and things got better. However, as I grew up, I was the only um, one that knew English the most in my family. So I had to always help my fa own family out as well as other Afghans whom always needed help with paperwork and other stuff. And um, as I grew up, I made a promise to my grandma, my parents and uncle that um, I would get a degree in the UK. And, you know, no matter what I would do, everything to reach somewhere to show that, you know, Afghan women are amazing and can achieve uh, great accomplishments like everyone else. And so I am proud to say that I was able to fulfill that and now I'm a graduate in politics and international relations. Um, now the fall of Afghanistan occurred just as I graduated and completed my degree. So it does allow me to view the situation from a wider scope. Um, what I can say is that Afghans need everyone's support and Afghans need unity from everyone to help them. Um, they are suffering in Afghanistan and fighting for their safety. Um, I have several members of my own family who are struggling right now and facing extreme threat by the Taliban. I've been fighting for them since August, trying to fill out forms from anywhere in the world to try and get them to somewhere safe. And I'm still in the process of trying out anything to get them out. Um, those who come to the UK are still struggling. And, you know, um, whilst hope whilst helping my local Afghan community and my own family members um you know I've had to help them with you know application forms housing issues visa issues and with the pandemic occurring life has become even more difficult um you know with everything now being electronic it's very hard to work around it even though I'm a young person myself it's still sometimes very difficult to navigate around so um you know, as I know that I struggle with it, I, you can only imagine what someone who doesn't know the language or anything has to go through in order to adjust to using technology all the time for everything. So, you know, there are many uh, obstacles that you face in the UK, even after reaching safety. So it's not all fairy tale, but, you know, we everyone is grateful to be safe, but it's not as like, oh, you come to UK to just you know, sit at home and just watch TV and just enjoy yourself. It is a very, very difficult process. 
and you know the struggle for afghans continue even in afghanistan and you know there are many afghans right now who are fighting for their lives it's desperation it's not that it's a want or need i don't think anybody would want to you know leave your own home country leave the place where you've been born leave the place where your culture is it's not something that you know you just be like oh no i want to go if people wanted to they would do that for holiday or something but this is fighting for their lives right now the taliban have cut off everything especially for women women you're not allowed education you're not allowed it's a simple you don't have the right to education and you know work as well even prior to this my family members who did work for example when they would get their passports they wouldn't admit that they are working as a women's rights activist advocate because if they did say that it still be mean that they could be targeted so as a fear they would just say yeah we're housewives so simple stuff like that for Afghan women is very difficult in Afghanistan. They don't have the quality and it is cultural issues that play, but it's mainly the Taliban right now. You know, everybody was finally thinking that Afghan women was, you know, getting somewhere. We were, they were paving a way. They were stronger. They, we are stronger, stronger than before. But now the Taliban has tried to push us down. And even now, if you see in the media, it is the Afghan women that are fighting and it is them that are trying to change everything. So I do hope everyone keeps them in their prayers, um, not just the women, but also the men. I have family members who are men who are equally facing the same amount of threat. But yeah, Af just pray for Afghanistan. Um, keep united um kindness is a good thing to give to everyone at the end of the day you don't lose anything from being kind so yeah thank you for listening guys well uh, thank you sarah for your eloquent contribution and congratulations on your achievements and thank on the uh work of support that you are undertaking for uh, the people of your country. Thank you. Now, we're coming closer to home because I'm going to turn to Liz uh, Griffith. And uh, Liz is the Head of Policy and Research at uh, the Laws Centre in Northern Ireland, and much of her work is focused on the rights of migrants, the asylum seekers, including securing the right of access to healthcare for all asylum seekers. Uh, the Law uh, Centre is part of a consortium of NGOs and is currently supporting Syrian refugee resettlement in Northern Ireland, preparing to start welcoming the Afghan uh, refugees as a result of the current uh, crisis. Uh, so, Liz, can you tell us something of the work you're undertaking at present? Yes, well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for everyone attending from home or uh, here in person. And thanks to the speakers who've gone before me and congratulations to Sarah for re uh, recently graduating. Um, great achievement. So I'm going to speak a little bit about the, the local context here for people seeking sanctuary and say a little bit about the what we hope will be the future Afghan resettlement programme for Northern Ireland to participate in. And then I want to alert you really to some um, dark clouds or storm clouds that are gathering on the horizon in the form of a piece of legislation going through Westminster. And I'd like to end by suggesting a, a couple of actions that you can take locally if you want to try and support uh, refugees living here. So to begin with the kind of the, the, the context, um, the last official statistics from the Home Office uh, that were collected in June showed that there were 800 asylum seekers living in Northern Ireland, um, primarily living um, in and around Belfast. Um, that number has risen quite significantly since June, and we have the highest number of asylum seekers who've ever, who've ever been here um, at present. Um, again, the, the official stats would suggest that in June there was only one Afghan um, asylum seeker. Um, the largest numbers of asylum seekers are people from China, from Nigeria, Somalia, Iraq, Iran, um, Syria. 
Um, the asylum process itself, so when people come here and they claim a, asylum, they, the asylum process is long and arduous for many, and many people struggle, as um, Sarah was you know, mentioning, there are, there are many hurdles that people face. Um, asylum seekers face many restrictions, so you know, qualified um, doctors, um, you know, medical profession, engineers, teachers, people can't work whilst their asylum claim is being looked at, um, which is a real loss of people's skills and prevents people from contributing. Um, asylum seekers can't access mainstream social security and the, um, although they receive a small payment from the government, it is very small, less than 40 pounds per person per week. And I mentioned that there's been a, a recent increase in number of people arriving. There are a couple of hundred people now living in very initial um, accommodation. And although uh, it is full board accommodation, the weekly um, payment is eight pounds a week, which if you can imagine if you're arriving you know, now with one bag at most of you know, belongings, being able to kit you and your family out with all the you know, winter clothes you need on eight pounds a week is extremely difficult. So moving on to talk a little bit about the, um, the Northern Ireland's participation in, in a resettlement programme, uh, we were really pleased, as I'm sure many of you were, back in August when the first and deputy first minister here committed to take part in a resettlement program for Afghans. Um, however, this commitment was given in August and to date, um, there haven't been any um, Afghans arriving through uh, an official uh, program here. Um, in terms of numbers, the UK government has committed to resettle up to 5,000 Afghans in the first year. So we anticipate that Northern Ireland will host perhaps 800 people um, in the program here. And we anticipate because you know, the, the, the plans are underway, but at the moment it looks like that the Afghans arriving here will come from England. So there are the Afghans currently living in hotels in England that will be moved across to Northern Ireland. Um, there are going to be two separate schemes one is for um, the former workers and their family members who were working for um, the British government um, in Afghanistan. So um, people like Bilal, who were you know, interpreters, um, cultural liaison officers, um, you know, and, and their family members would come under the first scheme. And the second scheme is more generally for Afghan citizens who were at risk from the Taliban. And of course, that is a very long list of people at risk, but it includes women who are, you know, women who held public office, um, professional women like Dr. Seema Nazari, um, people from the LGBT community, um, civil society activists, um, you know, the, the list goes on and on of people who would be at risk of the Taliban. And we hope that they will be able to join, um, to, to be un, um, admitted under this program. Uh, we hope, we anticipate that the Afghan resettlement program, that it might look quite similar to the Syrian program, which has now been underway for um, the last five years. Um, and the Law Center is part of a consortium of NGOs that are helping those Syrian refugees kind of find their feet here. And by and large, well, there've been 1800 people um, arrived through that scheme. It's gone, um, you know, broadly it's gone very well. There've been some wonderful success stories. Um, some of you might have seen just two weeks ago on the, the TV, a young uh, Syrian man called Hassan winning a Pride of Britain award uh, for his work here um, supporting other Syrian refugees. Um, so I'm rattling through this, but I want to draw your attention uh, to a piece of legislation that is going through Westminster. 
Um, this is the Nationality and Borders Bill. Um, and people have dubbed it the Anti-Refugee Bill um, because it is seriously going to undermine the whole concept of refugee status. Um, the Law Centre is a member of the Refugee and Asylum Forum and we are really concerned about the impact of this bill and what it will mean here. And the most concerning, I think, of all of the provisions is the provision to differentiate between refugees based on their route of arrival. So, you know, the Law Centre's view would be that, um, you know, that people should be granted refugee status based on whether they are at a real risk of persecution. That should be the criteria. But instead, the British government plans to differentiate refugees from those who come through official uh, refugee resettlement programs, such as the Syrian one and hopefully the Afghan one, and those that make their own um, independent, um, they arrive independently. And so the plan is that people who arrive independently will never be able to access full refugee status. They will never have the certainty that the, you know, an international definition of refugee, that that will never be granted to people who arrive under their own steam. Um, people who arrive independently will have to live in um, segregated accommodation, perhaps away from other communities. Um, they will have a temporary form of protection, so they will never have, you know, it will be extremely difficult for them to fully become integrated. Um, so, um, you know, what can you do if you're kind of interested in supporting refugees locally? I uh, have a couple of ideas. Um, one, you know, practically um, mentioned there are, you know, many asylum seekers arriving at the moment. Um, if you can donate warm winter clothes, uh, shoes, um, there is a couple of charities, including one called Storehouse, which is um, in the city centre in Belfast, and they're always collecting uh, clothing, bicycles for children, uh, laptops, tablets, particularly for children at school. They're always very welcome. Uh, other things you can do is support asylum seekers and refugees in, in your um, local areas. Um, English classes in particular is always uh, required. So, you know, volunteering in homework clubs um, is always appreciated. Um, the third thing you can do is speak to your MP about your you know, concerns you might have about this piece of legislation, because it will make life so much more difficult for people seeking sanctuary in years to come. And the, the final thing you can do is you know, be an ally to refugees and stand up and speak out against racism. And I kind of think we should all be channeling our inner Mary Ann McCracken, because I'm sure she would have been standing for refugees. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Liz. Thank you for your uh, contribution, uh, most thought-provoking, and particularly your drawing such a firm attention to the way the legislation that's underway is being um, drafted and the division it's making, which um, might not uh, uh, <coughs> have been brought to everyone's attention um, uh, quite so strikingly as you have just done. Thank you uh, for that. Now I'm going to move, ladies and gentlemen, to the question and answer uh, session uh, now. And uh, there are some questions which have already been uh, submitted. And uh, first, I'm going to call on Paul Mullen, who's in the room here, because he has a, qu a question which I'm going to direct towards uh, Sima and Bilal. Here it is. Uh, thank you very much for this, this evening. Um, with winter coming, uh, what will the next three months look like for the people uh, in uh, uh, Afghanistan? And uh, a related question, um, particularly with the Taliban in charge, how will foreign aid get to those people who need it most? Um, 
Thank you. I hope everyone heard that. And thank you to Paul for coming up so that the microphone uh, can uh, pick him up. Bilal, uh, did you hear that question clearly enough? Yes, I did. Yes. Uh, um, and I'd like to pass the question to you and to Sima, so maybe you could alert her uh, to uh, the issue, which is what does the immediate future look like and how will foreign aid get to those who need it? Um, Sima, I in the first of all, because I'm saying this in the first of all, I'm saying that و کمک های خارجی که می چ تو به مردمایی که دور دست هستند به روزونه خود رسیده توانست یا نه شما جواب بدین باز ما جواب میدیم آوازتان بند است مایکروفون اینکه در افغانستان یعنی مردم ما اکثریت فقیر هستند و زمستان هم که می باشه بر از اونا فوق لاده زندگی پر مشقب می باشه. دیگه ای که از طریق اینمی سازمان های خیریه یا سازمان هایی که مثلا حمایت میکنه از مردم. از اون طریق میشه که مردم ما را کمک بکنن جامعه جهانی. یعنی و دیگه ای که... خواهد رسید به اون مردم هایی که در دو دست, دو دست هستن بالخصوص. به مردم هایی فکر نمی کنن. فکر نمی کنو. مشکل است که مشکلات وجود داره و به خاطر شاید هم مشکلات یک است به خاطر مشکلات امیتی ما به اید می دانم که در مناطق محروم مخصوصا توضیح شوند یه شی بلیو ایت ایز گوین بی ای ویری هارد وینتر فر پیپل ان افغانستان بکیز موست آف آر پیپل لیوز این پاوری Um, uh, and 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 it's going to be a very difficult winter for them. In terms of aid, uh, it would be good to help Afghans um, uh, through any aid, any charity organization. But the problem will be for them for that aid to reach to uh, to people in the far side of the country uh, will be difficult because of security reasons. Uh, that's what she believes. Um, I um, I also agree with her. It's going to be a very very difficult. winter uh, because we have witnessed previously even when Americans were there and the aid was there the help was there um, that they've um, they they couldn't reach to those people who are you know who live far away uh, especially in the in in non-security area like unsecurity area where there was not control of the government uh, the help couldn't reach to them um, and this time is going to be even more harder um, Uh, and and also the the poverty is, is is out of this world. Even when they were there, there was people dying uh, from winter, from uh, cold, and and from uh, poverty. And now there's nothing. There's international aid is banned on them. Uh, international money is banned on Afghanistan people. So it's going to be a very difficult um, winter for Afghan people. So, uh, Bilal, can I follow up on that by asking, what is the route to providing aid uh, if there is one? Um, I believe uh, the best route is to um, to support the local charity organization um, because they're the one on the ground uh, and working daily work uh, instead of aid going to government, which at the moment is controlled by Taliban, run by Taliban. Um, and before that was a similar issue, the money would come and give into hierarchy and it will never reach to uh, the actual people who the aid is sent to. Um, so I believe the best, the best way to do is to send it to local trusted charity organization where that can be given firsthand to those people in need. Uh, thank you, Bilal. Well, I'm, I'm sure that will be noted and thank you to Sima for her guidance on this as well. Now, we have a question through the Zoom on, uh, from Christine, and um, it's come up on the screen. Um, it reads, and I'm going to direct this uh, question at Liz, and maybe Sarah, you would um, like to say something about this, but the question is this, how do the conditions attaching to the visas affect those coming into the UK from Afghanistan? Uh, and is there a bit, enough being done to protect the most vulnerable? So, Liz, what do you have to say uh, about conditions on visas? Yeah. Um, well, as I mentioned, people who come um, from Afghanistan and indeed anywhere else and claim asylum 
um, are subject to a number of really strict conditions whilst they're in the asylum system, such as not being allowed to work, um, such as having to live, you know, in a particular place, having to report regularly, you know, at the home office. Um, but, you know, the question there is about the conditions attached to the visas. And I think really the biggest problem is the difficulty in getting a visa to begin with. Um, and it is so very difficult for someone trying to get out of a conflict region to get a visa to come somewhere safe. You, there's no such thing as a refugee visa generally. You can't rock up to an embassy and ask to be recognized as a refugee. And what we see is the number of visas being granted to people from conflict regions are so small. So people have no option then but to travel irregularly. And people have no option but to get on those leaky boats across the Mediterranean precisely because there are no visas available to them. Um, and in, in terms of what is being done to protect the most vulnerable, um, the more the, the UK government um, try to close down routes of entry, the more we're creating routes for smugglers and human traffickers who are then exploiting the people who are so desperate to leave. Um, so, you know, rather than protecting the most vulnerable, we're actually putting them at more risk. Sarah, would you like to add to that? Yeah, I definitely agree with everything she said. Um, the first thing is that, you know, visas aren't being given. It's very, very difficult, um, no matter what the circumstances are. Um, the ARAP scheme, which is where if you have directly worked with the British troops, even that is actually hard to, uh, you know, to meet that level of requirement that they need. I've been told that myself by um, Secretary of Defence and other people in the UK. Um, and in terms of just normal trying to get even an emergency visa, it's nearly impossible. I've been fighting for my family members since August. I've been, you know, showing proof of... Um, what their occupation has been what they've done throughout the years and you know i'm i'm a british citizen my family has we've lived in the country for over like 15 years and you know we will be able to help them and support them if they come to uk and their people you know they were uh, well educated back home but even that it's not enough and you know no matter how like much of a risk they are it's just not enough the system isn't built that way it's very very difficult to get anything and you know there is no system to actually get those vulnerable people out and as she said um earlier that you know people are going to have to resort to the worst routes possible to get out because um i have family members who called me this morning they were saying that you know we don't have any other options sarah if you know, if if you're not able to help, like as in if it's not going to work, then we have no option but to just risk it, to just risk it and go by foot to another country. And that is so heartbreaking because I know that there's so many kids involved, but they're like, we're going to die by the Taliban or we're going to try and get out say, in one way or another. So the risk is very high. It is extremely hard. Um, and yeah, it's there isn't enough being done. Although there has been a lot done, there could be more. It's, you know, the people have gone through the war for over 20 years and, you know, helping them reach to somewhere safety is not, especially when their life is at risk, is not something that should be, you know, dumbed down on. Thank you, Sarah. Perhaps I'll just follow up with Liz on the question that's on the screen there from Orla, which is a different aspect of this, but it's, uh, I think, featuring on the resettlement programme. If a resettlement programme gets underway, what's, what's the time scale that you're anticipating uh, for um, people arriving under that scheme? Can you say? I'm, a, I'm afraid I'm not aware of what the time scale is. I mean, we'd hoped that... Um, we would have already started to welcome Afghans through a, an official um, program, but hasn't happened yet. But um, you know, the, the sooner the better, because 
you know, the more, you know, if, if the, you know, the more people we can welcome um, through safe and legal routes, you know, the, the better it is and it, present, it prevents people then having to make the dangerous routes under their own steam. Yes. Well, thank you. Now, there's an, an, uh, a further question um, uh, from uh, in the room, in fact, and it's uh, from uh, Tim, Tim McCulloch. Perhaps, Tim, if you come a little closer for the microphone to get you. <laughs> of course. Uh, Salam, Sima Sara, Chito Rasti, Bilal. Salam, Nikum, Rapport. So, uh, the question I've got is when you arrive into Ireland or England or sort of the UK, um, what's it first like? Uh, and the, the follow on is up. What access do you have in terms of employment, uh, education, uh, access to social care, the, the, all those sort of aspects with which integrate you in society? Thank you. Thank you. Well, Bilal, as uh, Sima is our most recent arrival uh, in Ireland, at least, could you ask her how she responds uh, to that question if you heard it properly? سیما جان میگه وقتی که اول آدم بیا با ایرلند شم وی سوال بر شما انتخاب کردن چون که میگه شما نامدین که بین با چی اجازه دارین به خدمات بر درس با کارهای خدمات به دیگه خدمات بر شما با چی دسترسی دارین میگه شما بگو که مثلا به تمام چیز دسترسی داریم مون تا بعض چیزا که است او چیزی که ما میخوایم او رقم نیست از جمله مثلا در قسمت مثلا هم ایژوکیشن یا کورس زبان انگلیسی چون من یک دکتر هستم برای من یک ساعت کفایت نمیکنه یا یک نیم ساعتی که میخوانیم یا در شش ماه برای من کفایت نمیکنه چون باید من زیاد بخوانم که بعد از این مداره که من پروسس شم من دوباره به عنوان دکتر جی پی امتیان بتم امتیان تافل بتم آیلز بتم دیگه ای برای کسی است که مثلا میخواید مثلا یعنی شاورش یعنی متکیش باشه چون اکثر کسایی که هستن با خانواده خود می باشن و تحصیلات عالی ندارن و قدر مثل ما یکی که ما یک دکتر هستم دو لیسانس و یک مستری دارم باید خیلی خیلی اگر بخواین در جامعه ایلان به اینان یک دکتر قبول شون این زمینه را که برای من مساعد ساختی برای من کفایت نمی کنم دیگه چیزا ام. که مشکل نیست که خوش هستم دیگه چیزای قابل قدر هستم من تو فقط در قسمت همی کورس اینا که تایمش بر من کفایت نمیکنم. Um, she is quite happy. Uh, she have access to quite a lot of stuff. But in terms of education, um, there's a lack of education there, especially for her standards because she's a doctor. Uh, the course she's doing is uh, English courses for an hour. Um, and that's pretty much for people who can, who cannot, uh, who doesn't have enough education and they want to learn the, the basic stuff. Uh, for her, if she wants to become a doctor or GP here uh, in Ireland to interrogate the community and serve. Um, so for her standards, an hour English course is not good enough to carry on her study and become a doctor here. So education is a, is a, is a problem right now. Liz, can you, can you uh, contribute on this as to the services or the easy or difficulty of uh, easiness or difficulty of accessing services? Yeah, I think um, it's useful to um, distinguish between asylum seekers and refugees. Um, asylum seekers are afforded very few rights and entitlements on arrival. And as I mentioned, people can be in that category for a really long time. You know, it could be months, it could be years, and in some cases, sadly, it's decades. Um, Whereas, thankfully, people who arrive under one of these official programs arrive with refugee status, which means that they can work, um, you know, once they arrive. Um, and they can participate more fully in society. Although, as Sarah was explaining, there are all sorts of other, you know, barriers that people might face, such as, you know, kind of digital exclusion, the language barriers, um, you know, as Sarah was saying, it's not always plain sailing, even for people who have refugee status. Thank you. I just draw attention to, to a comment that was on the screen there a moment ago. 
uh, from Neve McCourt, who works for Stephen Farry, who, who I should mention actually because of the work that he has obviously done in securing um, access for uh, people uh, to um, the, this uh, country. Um, it's to do with the sanctions that are being imposed and the impact that that is having. Um, there we are. Uh, the, this, uh, she says, the sanctions directly impact local support as NGOs and charities can't pay their staff, for example. This in turn disproportionately impacts women and girls who have less access. Uh, governments and UN must urgently decide how they deal with these uh, sanctions. Um, especially uh, given devastating levels of hunger, etc. Uh, Bilal, have you had um, experience of uh, this uh, problem about sanctions impacting uh, on uh, payment of uh, staff in charities and so forth um, within Afghanistan? Yes, um, it's uh, it since Taliban took over. Uh, they have, uh, you cannot even take your own money out of Afghan uh, out of bank. Um, I think at the first month or so, or they were not even allowed to take even a penny out. But then they have uh, permitted people to get $200 uh, per week, I believe it was. But because people didn't have money for a month, you know, so they all wanted money. Uh, I've heard news where people queued up for nights to reach their number, but then the banks ran out of money and they couldn't get money. Uh, and then they will go to another bank and try the same. So imagine the whole Kabul wants to go to 50 branches and want to get money out. And that's their own money. Um, and of course, salary, uh, any money you could get from benefits from government, uh, disabled people, for instance, people who are in government allowances, those money have stopped totally. Uh, we're talking about your own money. Although they have, they have claimed that they have, they have given some salary to, to some people, uh, but, but those are people, for instance, people who work in the airport where they cannot run it. So they have to have those stuff there. So they want to keep them sweet to come there. And that's, we're talking about a few people who run the airport, but uh, the majority of people, um, I would say all of the people have not got their salary. And the worst part is they cannot even take their own money out of their own accounts. So uh, what is the solution uh, to this? Is it a uh, removal of sanctions, or or is there a way of imposing sanctions and still uh, uh, having access to uh, funds for those that need them? Sarah, you, well, you, you want to? Uh, I see you've unmuted. Do you want to contribute? I think, yeah. I I mean, it's a tricky situation. If the sanction does get removed, the Taliban have full access to that money. That is going to be the reality of it, and they will use it in the way that they want to, as they are right now with the remaining resources that they have. They're using it for their own ability and for their own stuff that they want. But at the same time, I think a way needs to be made that, you know, at least maybe half the proportion of people's own salary, own money that they their hard work and money, they should have access to in the banks. Um, you know, majority of people, even including one family or member of mine, they have, they have, they did have some money, but that money was stored in a bank. Now, with the Taliban takeover, they lost their home, they lost everything, and they've run, a, run to safety, uh, hiding right now. But they still need some sort of fund to survive. Now they can't go to the bank to get any money out. Those stuff is making it very tricky for people to even survive. Because many people, they they put their bank uh, their money in banks because it was unsafe even prior to the Taliban takeover. It was quite unsafe in Afghanistan. So the sanctions is really put in a split um, decision for everyone because it's if they remove the sanctions, the Taliban have full access. They can take everyone's money and they will never, ever see the face of it again. But at the same time, People do need some sort of money in order to survive. I did hear that. Um, I'm not sure whether it was the UN directly itself, but there are some organizations that are now thinking to pay the teachers their salaries directly. So it won't go through the bank system. It won't go through you know, the Taliban. It will be done directly to all those who are teachers. They'll get their earnings. But that's, that's something that was said. It's still not being processed through. To my latest knowledge. 
thank you, uh, Sarah. Well, that's obviously a, a dilemma and no doubt the logistics of an organization paying individuals is daunting, um, uh, but that may be uh, one way uh, forward. Now, I think we're back to a resettlement program because Jeff Phillips has asked a question about support uh, for uh, resettlement and integration of uh, Afghan uh, families and how to do this uh, most uh, effectively. Uh, what is it that's um, uh, uh, really most needed when uh, the Afghan families arrive here uh, uh, under any resettlement? Uh, uh, program. What are the what are the first steps? What's the priority, Bilal? You've unmuted, so I take that as a signal uh, that that you want to tell us the answer. Yeah, I, I can talk on on my family's behalf. Um, I've, I've had this chat with someone else as well. Uh, the problem is, uh, of course, they're lucky to get to Ireland, uh, but most of those people uh, who like Sarah, uh, like uh, Sima, Doctor Sima. They want to get into community as soon as possible, but the process is very slow. There's no proper guidance for them. Um, I can give my brother example, for instance. He wants to, he finish her, his degree. He wants to start a trade, but for him in order to do anything, he needs his license, but there's no clear guidance for him. There's no one to help him to get his license. So it, things like that is very, very, very slow. It's not just about accommodating them or giving funding from government. Um, you know, most of those people don't want the government funding once they start their own job, but it's just the process to integrate, uh, integrate them to the community is very slow. Uh, and to, to fasten, you know, fasten uh, that process, the government can play a major role to pretty much facilitate. Once they're in those facilities, then there's uh, someone to guide them through, find them work and, and, and help them to get their licenses and stuff like that. Well, is in country is there not taking this country is is there not uh, any organisation which fills that role that, that um, Bilal is mentioning there that steps in to provide a guiding hand for those resettled? Yeah, so there are um, a number of organisations here um, working to assist um, asylum seekers and refugees and um, the Syrians that came through the program. Hopefully, the Afghans. Um, there's a consortium of NGOs which comprises of um, Bryson, um, Bernardo's, Extern, it's there, the Red Cross and the Law Centre. Um, so we all, we all do our best. Um, but there, there is a lot more that can be done and a huge amount of work is already going on in community. There's a um, whole host of volunteer English teachers, for example, that are busy, you know, um, teaching English. Um, but I think one of the, the key things, as Bilal said, is um, opportunities for employment. So even when people come and they have refugee status, so they're permitted to work, getting into employment is difficult. And so, you know, if, if there are people out there, you know, that run companies or, you know, there are spaces within your workplaces for refugees to provide people an opportunity to just get back into a professional workplace, then, you know, please... Um, you know, come forward, make yourself known and provide opportunities for, for refugees and other migrants who are just wanting to be able to, you know, stand on their own two feet and support themselves and families. Uh, Bilal, could I go back to Simma's experience? She wants to get working as a doctor. Now she's taking English classes, of course, as we've heard, but what uh, can you ask her what uh, she's been able to do by way of contact with medical authorities or getting whatever uh, training she requires in order to fit into the Irish health system? Where is she with uh, uh, progressing that um, uh, line? Imajan mega as fahimwa mega mikhe ki shuma doctor doctor ito ninja page bubarin. Uh, well, it's not a big deal. Then the doctor should be. Um, I'm going to give them. They're so English. 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 They're so English.
داکیمنت ترافل داکیمنت که هستن که ما میخوایم خانواده ما ده سال است که من ندیدیم پدر مادر خواهر برادرای ما که جرمنی هستن ما میخوایم اونا رو ببینیم ما چند دفعه من این مسئله رو در جریان گذاشتیم ولی بی توجه هستن دیگه از نظر ازی که برای من کلاس های مخصوص دایر بکنن یا مرا در نظر داشته باشن که اینی فرد مثلا دا آینده مثلا میتونه دکتر شود در آیلند یعنی زمینه را به من مساعد بکنه که از هر طریق که می باشه از طریق وزارت سیعتامه است از طریق نمی فهم کدم سازمان خاص می باشه نه ایچ ایچ چیزی وجود نداره نو شی هزن بین هلپ from uh, she haven't received help from anybody uh, even though they know she said they know that i'm a doctor uh, but she haven't received any help uh, from health department or any organization uh, they don't pay attention he said to the as uh, she said to these things um for instance she wants her travel documents sorted uh, to go and visit her family she haven't seen her family for many years but nobody pays attention she said uh, if mm -hmm. if they help me they they should provide me more courses and uh, lessons um for example the health department or other ngos and uh, obviously to for her to get her status and serve but uh, no she haven't received no help at all well uh we have uh, with us two counselors and we, we 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 have and they're members of the same party i think as the mp who was mentioned earlier uh who has been very helpful uh, in, in uh, what um, he's been doing. So what I uh, propose uh, uh, now, carried unanimously by the meeting, is that <laughs> they convey to Mr. Farre that there seems to be uh, a shortcoming uh, here. And uh, hopefully he can um, speak to whoever uh, might um, uh, pursue that. Uh, thank you all very much. Now, I'm conscious of the time. We're, 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 we're being timed, and uh, I'm going to draw things to, uh, to a close uh, now. Can I ask Bilal whether Shima wishes to say anything in conclusion? And then uh, you, yourself, and then Sarah, do you have any parting words uh, for us? سیما جان اولا خود گفت اینجا دو مشاور هستن از ام وکیلی که شما رو کمک است سیفن فاروی میگه وان نوت بگیرن برای ازو بگن که اینا کم آمدن به حساب در سیما جان دیگه میگه وقت خلاص از داخل این میکودم چیزه ها گفتنی داری برای از اینا داخل یعنی گفتنی خاص ندارم تشکر میکنم از دولت ایلند که ما رو کمک کدن و تشکر میکنم از خانم نیف و سارا که در این قسمت نقش امدر داشتن و تشکر میکنم از بقیه دوستا که نقش فرعی را داشتن مثل خودت تشکر دوست فاطمه جان اینا کسایی بودن که همیشه در قلب ما جای دارن واقعا ما سپاسگزار هستم و تشکر میکنم بسیار زیاد دیگه خوش هستم احساس امنیت میکنم ام ثانک یو एवरीवन ثانک یو سو مچ ات دی اند شی وانتس ٹیک دس اپورچونیتی اند ثانکس نیو and Sarah, who played a, a major role to help her get the, the visa and the Irish government. Um, uh, and once again, thank you, everybody. She feels happy. She feels in peace. Uh, thank you all. Uh, uh, and thank you and the best wishes uh, to her. Bilal, do you, do you wish to uh, say anything in parting? Yeah, thank you uh, so much, everyone, uh, for joining in uh, and people in the room. Uh, all I'm going to say is, uh, like uh, Sarah said before, please keep up guns in your prayers. And anyone who have influence, um, uh, any charity organization, uh, anything you can do, any bit counts right now for Afghan people. They're in the worst um, uh, scenario you can imagine. No money, no food, winter's coming. Uh, and on top of that, the Taliban uh, brutality. So please help as much as you can. And don't forget Afghans. Thank you so much. Thank you all for listening. Thank you, Bilal. Sarah, would you like to sign off? Thank you, uh, everyone, again, also for listening to me and to the rest of the speakers. I really do appreciate it. Um, I think this was an amazing opportunity to raise awareness about the situation in Afghanistan, so I'm very grateful. Um, and as um, Bilal said, 
you know, please do continue to keep them in your prayers. They are facing the worst. And if anybody has like any sort of um, guidance that is out there, any potential forms or anything to help, you know, a family that does need to escape, please do share it. It does mean a lot. I mean, I have been speaking to many people um, in order for that guidance. I don't mind. I can reach out to anyone um, to just help because I have, like I mentioned, I have my own family members that I'm trying to help. So anything will be appreciated and prayers and um there are many organizations that do help um, many people that do arrive in the uk so it is best to look at those you know local ones and just a smile to the refugees that you do see um you know just that is all they need and then they just feel welcome to not be scared um it can be daunting you know just to go in a different it's a whole different atmosphere when you leave Afghanistan the whole like just look just walking in the street is very different from walking the street in Afghanistan so a simple smile a simple hello um you know we'll get far well uh, thank you uh, uh Sarah and uh, best wishes to you uh, as well now the last item on my agenda is titled call to action so I'm going to make my call to action to uh, everyone. There are two things that you might consider. One, if you'd like to make a donation, please forward it to the uh, found Mary Ann McCracken Foundation, which will process the funds and send them on to an Afghan uh, support uh, group. And uh, you can go online and see the connections that you need uh, in order uh, to do that. And all the funds that have been raised by tonight's event will go to the foundation and be forwarded for Afghan charities. And the second uh, thing is in relation to clothing, which you've heard. When I spoke to uh, Halal earlier in the week, the one, Bilal, I uh, beg your pardon. Uh, when I spoke to him earlier in the week, the, 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 the most striking thing he, he, he said to me uh, was not that they wanted a lot of money. It was that they wanted clothing. The winter is coming, the temperatures are uh, very low, conditions are dreadful, and uh, people are without sufficient clothing. So what about that old coat in the back of the cupboard? Could you send it at, at Liz's suggestion to the storehouse in Belfast and all the other clothes uh, because they can be moved to Afghanistan and they're needed. So uh, please uh, uh, contribute what you can. Uh, thank you all very much. That's my uh, call to action, money and clothing. And speak to MPs about oh, yes, of course. <laughs> Don't of course. <laughs> speak to Stephen Farry because he's on the ball. Um, and anyone else? Yes, thank you, Liz, for reminding me of that. There's a gap in the contacts. Um, that completes my part. I'm handing back to Norman. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody. I want to thank, first of all, the our attendees, both in the room and on Zoom tonight. Thanks for your participation, for joining us this evening, and also for the excellent questions that have come through. But a particular thank you to our speakers, Bilal, Sarah, Seema and Liz. You know, every day we switch on the news, we read the newspapers, we hear about the difficulties and the tragedies in Afghanistan, and then we just walk away and forget about them. I think what you've done tonight is really bring it home, not only the difficulties for you when you come into a new country, but also in particular now for all those who are left behind in Afghanistan. So as Sarani says, we have a way forward now, we know how we can help. And uh, all of the attendees tonight will receive a digital evaluation form and links to some of those charities that we've referenced this evening, both from Liz and Sarani. And I know that all of you tonight will want to give some additional support so again, thank you very much um, to all of you and thanks to the three of you for dialing in and hopefully we'll meet again in the future.